good evening, everyone. Welcome to Woodbridge Energy Challenge. This is part of our ongoing effort to um, educate Woodbridge residents and help them learn about energy efficiency and solar opportunities. And I want to thank again our ad hoc committee, Lisa Connor, who's the chair and is here tonight, and Laura Fernandez, who isn't with us this evening. They put many, many hours into getting this organized for our town, and that made these programs available to us. Uh, you'll hear more about it tonight. There's both the, um, the home energy audits, which is not the focus this evening, but is an ongoing program, as well as the solar program. And um, tonight is our final presentation about the solar. Um, I believe we had 15 solar homes in Woodbridge when we started, and now we added 16 more. So we've more than doubled the number of homes that are going solar in Woodbridge. And I think it's a great, great opportunity. I want to thank everybody who's been involved with the solar and the energy challenge. And I will ask Maggie now from Connecticut Solar Challenge to give you some more details and get the program started. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you. I have to thank everyone for coming out, first of all, and your incredible town for putting this program together with me. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of behind the scenes, and you know, volunteers are so hard to find, and it was so nice of Lisa and Laura and everyone to come together and do this, and Betsy, of course. Um, so now I want to tell you about Connecticut Solar Challenge. I am a nonprofit, 501c3. I am here to promote clean energy. I go from town to town and run this program. And my role is to make sure that the town is getting the best uh, price in solar and from the most reputable solar installers. I work with a small list. There's a very long uh, background check that I go through in order to make sure that the solar and solars are the best ones for this program. Um, so without too much information, there's going to be, uh, what we do is there's usually a tiered pricing program that we offer to towns where you start at a higher price and the more people that come on, the lower the price goes. Well, with this program, uh, we knew that there was going to be a lot of interest here. We had run our program in Bethany years back, and we knew that the people in Woodbridge had been coming to us. So we started the pricing at a lower price. And we've already gone down the one tier, so you're at the lowest tier. This is the best time to go solar. We do have uh, state rebates. It is depleting. Um, bucket of money is what they call it. So there may not be state rebates for very much longer. So this is with the discounts that we're giving and the state rebates and the federal tax credit, best time to go solar. Um, I'm going to pass over the uh, floor to Chris Linda of Aegis. He's 25 years experience and a solar expert asked to speak many times for universities and uh, for business owners who are trying to learn the model. So um, I'm going to ask Chris Linda of Aegis to come on out. Good evening, folks. How are you? Good, thanks. So, it's a nice small crowd, so if you have uh, questions that come to mind, uh, don't hesitate to just kind of blurt them out. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, just kind of curious, so what, what brings you here tonight? Just uh, Clean energy. Clean energy. You're interested in, in solar on your home? or Yes. Yeah? Okay. Is pretty much everybody? Or in, is that, uh, is, what's your first um, concern? Is it saving money? Is it the environment? Or? Lower electric bill. Lowering your electric bill. Same? Yeah. How about you? Lowering my electric bill and also aesthetics of it, um, it is a concern of mine. Okay. Uh, that's, I mean, there's a bunch of pictures in the background here you can see. Um, aesthetics are always, you know, some, some people are really concerned with that, others just don't care. It's amazing. I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, uh, well, tonight, you know, I'm going to talk, obviously, about solar and learn a little more. You know, the idea with, um, I'll give you a little analogy, just, you know, the idea with a solar system is, you know, imagine you could bring home uh, 
you know, you could, you could go down to your local store and bring home a generator, right, that's good, that will generate all of your electricity for the next 20 years, and you never need to put fuel in it. It just runs and runs. That's essentially what you can do with solar. And you can do that, basically, without spending your, any of your own money. Um, you, can, you can literally start saving money from the day that you put the solar system on and turn it on. You can start saving money every month without having used any of your own money to put the system on the house. The big caveat to that is that your fuel is the sun. So you need plenty of sun on your roof. And Woodbridge is a little bit of a challenging town because there are lots of trees here. So I would say probably, you know, half the sites that we go look at are, are not that great. You know, especially uh, unless people are willing to take down trees. So that's one of the big questions we, we ask uh, when we come out to look at your site and assess it for a solar system is, you know, are you willing to take down trees? Because that's often the, will make all the difference between making it something that's you know, feasible economically and, and, and just you know, not feasible. So the state is, uh, you know, currently offering a number of different solar rebate programs. There's uh, the state sponsoring a, a, what's called the solar lease, CT solar lease. Uh, they're, they're also sponsoring loan programs, um, which offer low interest financing. And there's also uh, an upfront rebate for people who choose to purchase the system outright. Now, all of those programs are, are a huge benefit to, to consumers. The, the idea behind both the, the lease and the financing options are that uh, customers can put a solar system on their home, right? They can basically eliminate their electric bill and swap it, swap your electric bill for essentially a lease payment. So in many cases, what we'll see is a customer that you know, eliminates $200 a month in electric charges from their electric bill and will swap that out essentially for a solar lease payment of you know, maybe $150 a month. It really is dependent, the exact numbers are dependent upon your site, how your house is situated, the angle of the orientation of the house, the angle of the roof, and the exact shading analysis that we'll do when we come to, the, to your home. But with a program like the, the CT Solar Lease, you can, you know, essentially you can start saving money from the day that the system's put on your house. And many people say, well, that, you know, it sounds too good to be true. So, and it, it's not, but one of the reasons that, one of the things that makes this, that program and all of the solar rebate programs possible is the fact that the state has actually been collecting money from all of your electric bills from the, for the last 20, 25 years. There's a little surcharge on everyone's electric bill called the Combined Public Benefits Utilities Charge. All of that money is collected into a pool of money to the tune of, you know, at one time it was hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, a, in a bank account. And, and then basically given out one check at a time to customers who choose to go solar. Um, that money is used for a number of things. It's used for it's used for the home energy uh, audit, right? The home energy solutions program, where you get essentially seven or eight hundred dollars in in services for the cost of ninety nine. It won't cost you ninety nine. The other seven or eight hundred dollars comes out of that fund. And the same thing is true with solar. Uh, whether you whether you purchase, lease, or or finance the system. Part of it is being subsidized by the state of Connecticut. And then another large part of it is being subsidized by the federal government in, in, the, uh, in the way of 30% federal tax credit.
is actually a little map of the town showing all the, uh, the current contracts for installations here in town. It's actually, there's 18 of them. A um, couple hot water systems, mostly solar electric systems. All, all people that have decided to go solar through this, this particular program. The, the main types of uh, solar systems that we deal with, that we install, the number one is basically photovoltaic grid tie. Photovoltaic, also known as PV, or solar electric. Photovoltaic uh, systems that are grid tied don't provide any, any power in the event of a power outage. So if the utility power goes down, the system shuts off, and your lights are dark. A common misconception. The system can provide emergency power and act as a backup generator with the addition of battery, a battery bank and some additional equipment which allows it to disconnect from the utility grid. The other uh, types of systems that we deal with a lot are solar thermal, which are primarily for heating domestic hot water, taking showers, baths, laundry, that type of thing, as well as solar pool heating. So pool heating is um, probably the, there's no incentives, there's no rebates, but it's also the least expensive and has the, uh, the fastest payback if you're actually heating your pool now using some other type of fuel. This is a happy customer. It's a, one, one of their electric bills, you can see, they have a solar system on their house and uh, the bill is actually a negative number. Mine is $44. I'm sure all of us would like to get electric service. A negative number. <laughs> I would myself, but. This is, this is um, an example of a typical system, typical 6,000 watt or 6 kW system that would uh, offset 7,441 kilowatt hours of electricity a year. You can see that the, the total cost of the system is uh, 21,600, but after taxes, uh, tax credits, and state rebates, it's about half. So about 50% of the system. Um, in this particular system, based on electric rates as high as they are today, it takes, only takes about six years for itself to, for it to pay for itself. If you were actually to uh, you go through the CT solar lease and lease the system, and leasing is simply um, a transaction where basically a bank or the bank, a financial institution, actually owns the system. Right? It's installed on your home. They own it. They insure it. All you have to do is make monthly payments. Right? But those monthly payments are much lower than the energy or the electricity that it's actually generating. So in this particular uh, application, the customer is eliminating $117 a month electric bill, and they're only paying $76 a month for the lease, which is for the leasing of the system, which is generating $116 a month worth of electricity. Do you own the thing at the end of the lease, or is it a car lease where you just have to give it back and go continue the lease forever? So you can either you can do a cut number of things, right? Anytime after five years, the lease the typical lease term is twenty years. Anytime after five years, you can opt to purchase the system. You can continue leasing it for the life of the lease, which is up to twenty years. At that point, you for some nominal amount of money, you can either buy the system or or opt to continue leasing it for another five. So it's pretty flexible in terms of you know, your, your options. So it renews every five years? No, it's a 20 year term, right? But anytime after year five, you have the option of purchasing it. So you basically can call the leasing company and say, you know, at year six or seven or eight or nine or whatever it is, say, I'd like to What's it going to cost me to actually just own the system at this point? And they'll give you a number. 
So he retired in for 20 years. Yeah. You're, you're tied in for 20 years, but again, it's kind of like me saying, um, you know, giving you a $50 bill every month, you know, you say, well, no, I don't, I don't want to take it. <laughs> because you're saving money every month for the 20 years that you owe, that you are leasing the system. Yeah. And, and that's the part you have to put faith in, that you're going to actually get 50 bucks extra a month. Per no, month. I mean, those numbers are concrete. When we, when we give you a proposal, we tell you exactly what the monthly lease payment will be and exactly how much electricity it's going to generate and exactly, you know, what that looks like financially, how much money you're going to save everybody. And those numbers are all guaranteed. If the system doesn't generate what we, what we tell you, um, then we actually owe you money to make up the difference. Um, we've never had a system not generate as much electricity as we tell you, and that's really the only place that there's room for error in the whole equation, uh, because all the other numbers are firm. They're concrete, they don't. And so that'll be written in the lease? Absolutely. Yeah. If you sell your house in the interim, if you're, if you're leasing it, yep. does that terminate the lease, or uh, how does how it work out? No, nope. exactly. the lease doesn't terminate. So if you sell your home, um, Again, you're going to have to basically transfer the lease. The new owner is going to have to assume the lease. I mean, what if the old, new owner doesn't want it? They have to. It's just a condition of the sale. It's kind of. It would be kind of like them saying, you know, I want to buy your house, but you know, I don't want the shingles that are on the roof. Yeah. Yeah. Comes a picture. Yeah. Exactly. And it, and it, and a condition of the sale. The environmental impact from just that one 6KW system is, is tremendous. You, know, just, you can see the you know, equivalent of removing 245,000 pounds of carbon dioxide from the air. So it's, you know, financially it's a great deal, but environmentally it's a home run. If the whole town you know, put in solar, uh, we'd be breathing, we'll be breathing much cleaner air. <coughs> What's the efficiency like in the wintertime? I mean, we get a lot of snow here. So, so that's an interesting question, right? People always say, well, what about, you know, what about winter? What about clouds? Um, you know, and, and the reality is that, that none of that really makes any difference. The only thing that we look at when we size a system, right, and, and the only thing that really makes a difference for the economics and the size of the system is what, how much power you consumed in the last 12 months. So the first thing we do is ask for an electric bill. And we take your electric bill, take your account number, we go on the CLMP website, we download a spreadsheet that show, tells us exactly uh, how much power, how many in kilowatt hours right, that you used in the last 12 months. And that number is going to be somewhere between you know, 7,000 and 20,000 kilowatt hours. Right now it's zero. We haven't closed on the house yet. So okay. You don't have any history on it. No, but we have, uh, we have potentially have history from the previous owner. But that won't be our usage. It won't. You're right. In that case, it would have to be estimated. And we can do a pretty good, pretty close job of estimating. But typically, we're looking at past usage right, as the best indicator of future usage. and. Then we'll design a system, or try to design a system that will do 100% of that. It doesn't matter when you use the electricity or when you generate the electricity. You can sort of think of the electric grid as, as, a, as, a, giant, as, a, as a giant swimming pool full of water. Right? And during the day, when you're generating electricity, you're just pouring water into the pool. Right? And at night, when, when the sun goes down, and you're using electricity again, you're just taking it back out. But that's exactly the way a solar system works and solar energy works. When you're sending those kilowatt hours back to the utility grid during the day, which you are most days, you're just building a credit, kilowatt hours. And then you're just going to draw that from that bank of kilowatt hours um, you know, later when the sun goes down. Now, 
the total kilowatt hours, when we design a system and look at what your system is going to generate on an annual basis, you know, we, we don't even look at what it's going to do on a monthly basis or a weekly basis. We don't even care. Many, and many, many of the systems uh, won't generate power for a week or two weeks at a time in the winter time, in the middle of the winter. It doesn't make any difference. You're still eliminating your electric bill because what happens is in, in the fall and summer and, and uh, you know, the spring, summer, and fall months, you're actually generating a surplus of electricity. Right? And you're going to carry that surplus forward to cover the months when you're not generating enough or not generating any at all, or, or the weeks when you're not generating any at all. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What if your house cannot take a beginner system to replace 100%? And are you still able to get the rebate and the tax uh, credit? So you mean you can't fit a system that will generate 100%? Yeah. Right. So that, right, that's a problem we run into as well. Right? A lot of times someone will have fairly high electric usage and the, the roof itself isn't large enough to put enough panels on to generate a hundred percent. In that scenario, you know, we our proposals will say, you know, the system is seven, you know, 0.5 kW, and it will generate eighty percent, right, of your annual electric consumption, or ninety-five percent, or fifty percent, or whatever it is. The reality is that the economics of the system, right, in terms of return on investment, payback in years, are all regardless, are the same. They're exactly the same, regardless of whether you're generate, only generating 50% of your power or 100% of your power. Can you still get the state rebate? Absolutely, yeah. You could generate any percentage of your power. Um, you're still gonna get a rebate and incentives on any size system that you put on your own. <coughs> So uh, what if you're like 15 years into 30 year singles and you decide to go with the lease program? Your, your roof could theoretically or hypothetically uh, not withstand the lease, go before the lease is up, right? Possibly, you know, 15, if you have 15 years left on your shingles, I would, you know, if you had less, Usually anything less than 10 years, 10 years or less, we usually really recommend that you replace the roof, right? What happens is once you put the system on the roof, the shingles underneath the system tend to almost freeze and age. You almost stop the aging process because they don't get much weather and they don't get any sunlight. So they stay pristine, but the shingles around the edge of the system continue to age. The, the life of the shingle or the shingle you know, life within typically, you know, you see it as like a, a 30 year shingle or a 35 or you know, a 45 year shingle. Um, it's just an indicator of the life, right? Some of those shingles may not last as long as they tell you if it's depending on right. where they're located and some will last much longer. So part of us doing a site assessment is really looking at your roof and to determine, you know, what we think or what we feel is you know, if it looks like they're prematurely aging, we're gonna let you know, you know, and, and you're gonna have to make that determination. You know, the reality is that the systems are designed to last somewhere between 30 and 40 years, right? So those panels are gonna be up on your roof between 30 and 40 years generating electricity. So if you're, if they need to come off because the roof needs to be replaced, it's probably gonna cost a couple thousand dollars anyway Take them all down, replace the roof, and put them all back up. Can they, they can't. They can't move up to the system and then use flashing to fill the gaps. Possibly. Would we, you know, would we recommend it? No. You know. I just figure if the ones underneath are so good. Then sure. You have you know what? Roof, right? We haven't really run into that yet because it hasn't been. You know, but okay. that, and certainly in the next ten years or more, or, you know, that's gonna probably gonna see a lot of you know, creative uh, ideas around figuring out how to do just that, so. And then if you're in a lease, you're responsible for the payment, for taking the panels off? I mean. No, the leasing company's responsible. Well, you're responsible for 
you know, if the roof needs to be redone, you know, that would be on you to have the panels taken off and put back on. You know, if anything were to go wrong with the system, if it was damaged, uh, if the panels failed, something like that, then that would be the leasing company that would be responsible for repairing the system. So to go back to roofing just for another second. Sure. If you do need a new roof, is there any coordination necessary between the people who put the roof on and your group, for example, or is it advised that nope. you just get the whole roof done and then have you do your thing? Just get the roof done and then we come in afterward. Yeah. There's no previous coordination. Yet. Um, going back to your point about the maintenance, what if you own it, who's responsible for the maintenance if it fails? under a warranty where you come out and fix it? Yeah, if, if you own it, um, there's a couple of things, right? All the equipment is typically warrantied from the manufacturers for 20 to 25 years. Our company also has a 20-year complete coverage uh, on, on the system itself, so if there's any failures, uh, we'll, we come out and fix them. You know, or we basically service the warranties, right? We'll go to the manufacturer, get the right product, come out and fix it, if the manufacturer's not around, then it's on us to fix it. Is there any standard regular maintenance required? And what happens like with hail and things? Yeah, there's, there's actually no uh, standard or regular maintenance required. Um, all the panels are designed to withstand at least a one inch hailstone shot at 55 miles an hour. <laughs> Never seen one break yet. You can actually hit the panel, the face of the panel with a hammer and it won't break. Um, the, it's a tempered glass. They're very durable. <coughs> so that's that's really not a concern. You know, in the thousands and thousands of panels we've put in over 25 years, we've yet to see one actually break from something hitting it. Now what happens with snow? With it? Does it not accumulate because it's warm? The panel itself is warm or does it just pile up on it and then you'd have weeks where it just so be covered? It really depends on the pitch of the roof. Right? So the steeper the pitch, the quicker the snow slides off of there. I mean, it, it is glass. Right? It's a glass surface, so it's very slick. It's not like you know, regular, a regular shingle asphalt roof. You know, it's, it's like 50 grit sandpaper, right? Yeah. Yeah, right? It just grabs the snow and it doesn't move. So these are a sheet of glass. So the snow, is, it slides off very quickly. And as soon as the temperatures uh, warm up a little bit or the sun starts to hit it, it warms up very quickly and, and it slides off very quickly. Um, the lower the slope, if you have a really slow, low slope, you know, we had some customers that said their snow last winter was up there and, you know, for a week or two, but. And the weight doesn't damage them. No, the weight doesn't damage it. There's no issue with the weight, you know. And typically, it makes it it makes it less weight because the snow's coming off of those right. quicker than it is the rest of the roof. You know, the shingle, the panels themselves, in terms of weight load, are the equivalent of adding another layer of shingles to your house. They're really they're about two and a half pounds a square foot. It's really negligible in terms of weight. Um, I was reading an article about some concerns about <coughs> pan, um, the solar panels with um, the fire department. If there's a fire and you know how they have to go into your roof and if you have paneling, I've read there's a concern about how the firemen deal with that, the roof and the paneling and they were concerned the article was talking about how they could get maybe uh, electrocuted. I mean, have you heard of th those Yes, concerns? absolutely. And, and actually, I work, I've been working with a number of uh, fire departments and giving presentations because, you know, for the most part, a lot of this stems from um, a lack of knowledge, right? A lack of understanding about how the, the systems work and that the dangers have really been, you know, exaggerated. Them, frankly so from from our perspective or my perspective as an installer it the concerns are overrated um, okay and you know that, that's all I can say yeah when I was read it I was like wow but I have seen that you know okay um, 
two questions. Um, one, for roofs with existing attic fans. Yep. Does that present a problem for the system other than having to work around them? Take them off. Touch them up. Well, but the attic fans are there to to evacuate heat from the inside of the... So here's one of the benefits, right, ancillary benefits of solar is when you, when you cover up your southerly facing roof, all of a sudden your attic is like 20, 30 degrees cooler because you're not getting all of that solar thermal heat into your attic anymore. The panels are elevated off the roof by about four or five inches, and all of the sun and the sun's energy is hitting the panels. Right? The whole roof is, stays cool. And that heat, that air flow is going under the panels, causing a convection, cooling it even further. So, so people will find that their roof, their attics are, are much cooler than they were in the past. If so you, you actually have to remove the, the fans? If you have enough roof space, you could certainly work around the fans, but um, you know, if they were really causing an issue with the way that the panels laid out, it's a pretty simple matter just to yank the thing out and patch it in, remove patch it in and just move it. My get rid of it. Right. My second question, um, does uh, an existing uh, backup generator present any problems to installing the system? None whatsoever. You know, if you have an existing backup generator, everything the way that your generator works now is going to remain the same. Yeah, because you said that once you lose grid power, you're going to lose the solar power, power as well. So. For somebody with a backup generator, you would want the same thing to still happen. The backup generator kicks in after 30 seconds, yeah. or a minute, or whatever it is. It's nothing, nothing would change. Nothing would change. If you don't, have, you don't need a different transfer switch or nope. anything on the backup system has to change. Provided your your system was installed professionally, it was, right? and you're not plugging into your dryer plug or something. No. Turn off the main. Um, no, there's, I mean, there's a transfer switch. Yeah. Then nothing would change. Be completely seamless and work exactly the way. You know, none of it would even be disturbed, frankly. We'd be, we'd be actually literally hooking in on the utility side of the transfer. Okay, so you hook up the utility, so once utility power goes out, everything still works as it is. Yep. Okay. So they have solar systems with battery backup, so if you if you were to get one of those, would you need, uh, you know, a generator? No. So it, it would take it takes place the place of the generator. generator. Yeah. But how long does the battery nice. last? Well, the idea with a, with a battery backup system is that it's right, you're replenishing batteries with sun, right? Right. So you could live off you could live without power for two hours, two days, or two years, frankly, or the next twenty. You know, you could essentially the system operates as an off-grid system, and every day you're just filling those batteries back up with the sun. So you never need to put fuel in it. So if you lose power for an extended period of time and you have that battery backup, you're going to probably have what you need for the house. Provided, yeah, pr provided that um, you live within your limits, right? So you have a limited amount of power. So you can't, you know, do laundry every day and run your dishwasher. You know, you're going to have to live. You have to live a little bit more conservatively to live within the constraints of how much power the system will provide. Is it possible if you were, if you lease a system, can you purchase an add-on battery backup? Yeah. The, the battery backup component mm -hmm. it is not something that you can lease. You can purchase but you can purchase. If you, can, you can lease the system and then purchase a battery backup. Correct. Okay. And, excuse me, mm -hmm. is that battery backup good for your pump system? Will it run a well? Sure. I mean, we have we have people who run everything in our, from, you know, everything from a couple of, uh, you know, maybe a, a furnace and a refrigerator and a couple lights to their entire homes on battery.com. So, and it's seamless. You don't have to do anything, right? It's just pulling from the power grid normally? It's completely seamless. It's actually so seamless that um, we actually had a customer in Madison who called us um, shortly after we installed the system for them and said, you know, so many outlets in my house aren't working. And 
We went to their house and come to find out the power on their street had been out for two days. <laughs> oh, wow. They, we had separated, a, a, you know, just the primary circuits into a, into an emergency panel, and so some of the outlets in their house weren't attached to that, and they didn't even know that they were on emergency power. It actually switches over so quickly that you don't even see the lights flicker. What is the average price of like a battery backup? Mm -hmm. Price range or price range. range? So they start at about fourteen thousand dollars. It's equivalent to putting in like a standby. If you were to put in a standby, you know, fixed automatic start standby generator, the costs are equivalent. Right? It really runs somewhere between fourteen and twenty-four thousand dollars, depending on how large of a system. The benefit is that you get thirty percent of that back. Right? If you do it as part of the solar installation, you're going to. Re get 30% of that cost, reduce it by a third as a, t as a federal tax credit. What's the, uh, the footprint on the battery, uh, you know, inside the home, does it take up a lot of space? And um, <coughs> how long do the batteries last? Okay, so there's... So that's a rack. Those battery, that rack is actually about 24 inches deep. Right? Each one of those batteries is four or five times the size of a car battery. They're about 150 pounds a piece. So that's about 50 inches wide, 24 inches deep. It's a, like a 50 kW battery bank. And how long do those batteries last before they gotta be replaced? 15 years plus, 15 to 20 maybe. They're totally sealed. They're, there's no maintenance involved. You know, one of the reasons that they last as long as they do is because right, they're just sitting there. Right? They're, the only time they're utilized is in the event of a power outage. So they're just getting a triple charge and they sit there full all the time. So they, they don't get work very hard. This particular installation is in Fairfield and, and it's one where she's actually operating her entire home. In, in one of the hurricanes, uh, which hurricane was it that you know, the first one? We had, you know, down there they got hit really hard, and there were a lot of people that were, on the, especially on the shore down there, that they all have, you know, big mansions and uh, big generators, and they all, all their gener, they thought they were all sitting pretty. All their generators were running, but you know what? They were without power for three plus weeks. And all of their generators started running out of fuel after five, seven, eight days. And then they couldn't get any fuel. So they were sitting with these big generators that didn't do anything for a week and a half, two weeks, because they couldn't get any fuel. And um, that's when these systems started to really look a lot more attractive. So. This uh, lady was actually running her dishwasher every day, even though she lives alone by herself, <laughs> doing laundry and turning all her lights on and uh, didn't have any problems, so. I, I missed the beginning, but you do a site assessment and because we have a lot of trees, and then you just say whether it's feasible or not, or yeah. you so, cut down trees. So, so really what we do, right, is the primary thing that we do is, is come out and do a site assessment. If you're interested in solar, the only way to give you accurate numbers is to come out, and there's no obligation or cost, right? Come out and look at your site, and right? we have to know exactly how much tilt your roof is on your roof, which way it faces, and do an actual on-site shading analysis. So we can determine how much sun hits your roof on an annual basis. While we're out there, we can say, yeah, you know, that tree and that tree would have to come down to make this feasible. Um, otherwise, it just doesn't, you know, doesn't make any sense. Um, and then, but once we collect all that information, we put together a proposal with, you know, num exact numbers, right? To tell you exactly 
how much, how large of a system we can fit on your roof, exactly how many kilowatt hours it would produce in a year, you know, how much that's going to save you, what the return is on investment, what the lease payment is, what all of the numbers that, that you would need to make an informed decision. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. You then have the option of purchasing something or leasing something. Yep. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, you know, you can always purchase the system outright, which is um, there's federal tax credit to state rebates that are applied to that. You can uh, there's a leasing option and there's also a financing option. Um, Patricia in the back can actually is here tonight. She can actually sign you sign people up tonight for a site assessment. Uh, she can actually make an appointment for you and someone will come to your home and, and take all those measurements and give you all that information. Um, with exact numbers. And the winter sun generates, if the winter sun contribute? So the sun, yeah, absolutely. The sun, yeah, we, we look for trying to get sun. The system is generating power all year round. Right? Winter time, every time, all, all year round. It's, it's generating a lot less in the, in the winter time. The only, the only numbers, like, um, it must come in later, but the, uh, we don't look at like, when the system produces in terms of uh, like month, it doesn't matter how much it produces any month or any, any any given day. We just look at what the total is over a 12-month period. Thank you. Any other questions? I did a good job of answering everyone's questions. Um, the house is heated by hot water, and I understand how this heats up the hot water, but the boiler is fueled by oil. Will this also reduce the oil bill? No. We have, so we have two very distinct, different technologies, right? We're talking right now about solar electric, and that's, right, these are all solar electric systems on, on roofs. They only generate electricity. That's all they generate. They don't generate any hot water. They don't heat your home unless you have, a, have uh, electric heat, right? All they're generating is electricity, and the only thing they're going to offset is your electric bill. There are solar thermal or solar hot water systems uh, available. The, a system like that would help you reduce uh, oil costs if you're heating hot water with oil. Sure. Um, our house, we, our house, we have three heat from geothermal. So everything in the house is electric. There you go. Yeah. But our electric bill is high as I don't know what. Especially for I me, mean, it's nice to know we don't need oil or gas, but boy, do we pay up the yin yang with UI. <laughs> sure, you, yeah, you've basically gotten rid of all your other energy sources and you're completely dependent on electricity. Yes. So, yeah. 100%. That's why we're here. <laughs> so yeah, you're you're an ideal solar customer because you you know you have such high usage. And we have no trees that need to be cut down. Oh, well, there you go. Well, the ex owner, I guess his idea maybe later was What's to the go solar. We had a few other solar companies that come out, right. and we are no, we know that we are. Oh, the house is situated perfectly. I mean, it's a, geothermal is is pretty efficient, right? However, it, um, you know, you are putting all of your eggs in one basket, right? So if electricity grades go up, then you're kind of screwed because you're, you know, completely dependent on electricity for everything. And would you say the more people go solar, you are the ones that doesn't go solar. The rates are going to keep going higher and higher because <laughs> they, you got people have to get paid for the service. 
solar? Well, essentially, the people that um, that don't go solar are are actually paying for those who do, because they're continuing to pay a surcharge on their electric bill every month that's used to pay other people to go solar. Right. So there's a surcharge right on your electric bill that's used to fund these programs and pay for the incentives for other people to go solar. How long were they to have that been in effect? Um, that surcharge has been on the electric bills for at least 20 years. long time. So, so once you go solar, do you continue to pay the surcharge? No, you actually eliminate it. Oh, wow. You eliminate all the fees, taxes, everything. The only part of your electric bill that you typically can't eliminate is the meter charge. Oh, wow. Oh, which nice. is uh, $19 a month. So. And that meter supposed to be going backwards, right? Essentially, you're running the meter backwards. Yeah, essentially. If you don't have room on uh, on a roof, right? If your house does, you don't have enough space on the roof, and you have uh, property, there's always ground mounted options. These are just a few photos of different uh, ground mounted options for solar arrays. You can see some of them are quite large. This is a uh, this array is actually on an island in off one of the Thimble Islands in Brantford. Um, that had it's about eight feet above sea level, and it literally had waves crashing over it from the last two major hurricanes, and didn't sustain any damage. The seagulls also use it to <laughs> smash open oysters and quahogs. They fly at about 50 feet, drop them on the panels, and they roll off, and then they have their little oysters on the half shell uh, on the bottom patio. So. To date, there hasn't been any damage to the panels, uh, but it makes a hell of a racket when they're out there doing it. So, this other, there's another. This system over here is what's called a dual azimuth tracker, and that system, actually, that particular system is right in, in Bethany. Um, there's a number of them in Bethany, and it that whole panel just follows the sun wherever it is in the sky. It turns and follows the sun. Can those be leased? No. <laughs> Ground mounted systems can't be leased. Only uh, roof mounted systems. So. There's a couple of solar analysts here tonight that, you know, Mark, uh, Leslie, they can pull up your house uh, on Google Maps, take a look at it, and see if it's a good site. Um, Trisha can sign you up for a site assessment if you're willing, if you're like to have your home assessed and know exactly what's possible. And I'm available for more questions for anyone who's uh, who has more any questions I didn't answer. Great. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Thank you for coming.